Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us from preschool to teen. This is the show where we help you feel better about the mom you are and share our own parenting tips and personal stories. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everybody. I'm Sarah Powers, and you are listening to the Mom Hour podcast. Welcome. This is one of our monthly voices interviews where either Megan or I bring on a guest that we think you'll love hearing from. It's usually somebody who has a perspective or a story to share that's unique and a little different from what we bring to the show during our regular weekly conversations. If this is your first time listening to the Mom Hour, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you'll stick around for my conversation coming up with Bianca Dotton. And I also hope you'll subscribe to the show and listen to our regular Tuesday episodes. Those are where Megan and I get totally real and authentic about motherhood and parenting and life with a bunch of kids. It's just the two of us. We take a different topic each week. And so I hope you'll come back for that. Before I introduce you to our guest today, let's talk about one of our amazing sponsors. And I'm really excited about this. It's so perfect for a show that is going to be all about supporting new moms and new babies. And that's what Bianca and I are going to talk about. I am welcoming Bordeaux Butt Paste and their newly launched Rash Kicking Kit. So if you guys are in the diaper changing days right now, and it hasn't been too long since I was, you know how much of a pain, like literally a pain, diaper rashes are. Baby's miserable, diaper changing is torture for both of you, and it's really easy, in my experience, for a mild rash to get out of control quickly if you don't have what you need on hand. What I love about the rash kicking kit from Butt Paste is that it packages both the regular and the maximum strength formulas of their butt paste, and both of those are free from all the bad stuff you don't want, dyes, parabens, preservatives, and it packages those with this handy silicone applicator. Think of like a super soft spatula for your baby's bottom. So you can apply the cream quickly and thoroughly without doing that thing where you smear it all over yourself and the changing table and like the baby's head while you're trying to put the diaper on with your other clean hand. Or that other thing where you really want to get it in all the little crevices of baby's bottom, but instead it's just under your fingernails. Yeah. So that maximum strength formula is the real deal, you guys. It's clinically shown to provide relief in as little as three hours and offers protection that lasts all night. So it's really a barrier to that moisture that makes the rashes so much worse. So guys, this applicator thing was not available when I was changing diapers, and I wish it was. It's genius. And the fact that it's in a little handy kit for around 15 bucks means that I will pretty much be adding this to every baby shower gift I buy from now on. You guys can get the kit on Amazon, and I will link that up in the show notes as well at themomhour.com. So thanks again to Bordeaux Butt Paste for partnering with us on this episode. Okay, I'm about to introduce you to Bianca Dotton, today's guest. But before I do, I want to talk about something real quick, and that is that this episode contains some potentially sensitive topics. Bianca's story involves a traumatic birth experience and also her family's experience with infant loss, and she tells it in a really beautiful way. I I hope you stick around for our conversation, but I realize this could be potentially upsetting to some of you. Um, It's upsetting to all of us as moms. If you are particularly affected by these topics or if you have curious kiddos listening with you right now, I just wanted you to have this information so you can make the right choice for you about when and whether you listen to this episode. Okay, I'm really excited for you to meet Bianca. She's a lifestyle blogger and mother from Florida, and she is the founder of Mamas of the NICU, which is a nonprofit organization and an online community for moms with babies in the NICU. Bianca started the organization after her own experience with premature birth and a six-month NICU stay with her son, Tristan. And in this conversation, you're going to hear us talk about ways that really all of us can better support and understand NICU families and how her community specifically helps moms of NICU babies feel connected and empowered during and after their journey. It's really an amazing conversation, an amazing story, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's get right to my conversation with Bianca. Hi, Bianca. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be on the show today. So I'm excited for our conversation. I'm really excited. And um, just for our listeners' background, I met you briefly, or I, I don't even know if we met in person, but I was in a session with you at Mom 2.0 last year um, when you talked about launching your community. And ever since then, I have just thought to myself, I haven't heard of other organizations or communities for NICU moms and just the the way you described it briefly in that session stayed with me. So um, I'm really happy to have you and have this conversation as well. Thank you. Um, so maybe just if you don't mind telling your story, specifically the time that you spent in the NICU with a baby, um, because I know that that story obviously inspired what you're doing now. So I would love if you want to share that with us. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, my husband and I, we were planning our wedding. We weren't planning at all to have a second child. We had been trying previously for, um, you know, about, it was around eight months. And after the nine month mark, we had just decided to stop trying because it wasn't happening. Um, and then we went on a birthday, a fifth birthday trip for our daughter, who is now seven. And um, two months later, we found out that we were expecting a baby. So we were four months into, you know, planning our wedding. And now mm -hmm. we were expecting our second baby. And we were so excited and you know, weren't expecting any of the things to come along with it that did. Um, but it was it was a journey. So um, I ended up giving birth to Tristan at 34 weeks, which was kind of unexpected because, you know, I've had a fairly healthy pregnancy. I had, you know, a few trips to the emergency room, but just, you know, like a stomach bug here and there. Right. So nothing... Um, to be overly concerned with and then you know around 29 weeks I ended up being admitted for um, preterm labor so I was on after that I was put on strict bed rest I wasn't allowed to pretty much do anything um, I wasn't even allowed to leave the bed I know sometimes people get put on bed right. rest and they're still able to do you know some minor things right pretty much I was confined to the bed and I was only allowed to shower and, and that was as much work as I was allowed to do. Um, so then around 34 weeks, Tristan decided to um, pop into the world and I ended up having him in the emergency room. It just so happened that that day my husband was in Tallahassee, which is four hours away oh, gosh. Um, at a Florida State game because I had been on bed rest for almost five weeks and it was football season. So we <laughs> decided, you know, okay, you can go to one game because you haven't been to a game all season. Mm -hmm. And that just so happened to be the day that Tristan um, decided that he wanted to be born. <laughs> so my husband had to rush back to Orlando. Um, and then Tristan was born. We weren't expecting him to go into the NICU for as long as he did. We did know that he would have to be admitted because there was a chance that he would be born early. Um, from my last hospital stay, they prepared us that he would be coming, you know, at any time. And he, I probably wouldn't make it to 40 weeks. Right. So they did tell, her, tell us that he would be, you know, admitted to the NICU because he would be born early. But we weren't expecting him to be born with as many anomalies as he was. And it was it was a different situation than we were prepared for. So he was born at 34 weeks. And we were, when he was born, he was crying. And he took that first breath. Um, and then when they brought him over to the next room over, um, he had stopped breathing. Mm -hmm. So that was his main reason for having to be admitted into the NICU. Um, and we ended up being there for six months. Um, he had, you know, over a dozen anomalies that we didn't know that he would be born with. And mm -hmm. they caused a lot of um, issues for us throughout our stay. So, um, but his main concern was just breathing on his own. And mm -hmm. he ended up having to get a tracheostomy. So that was, um, part of the main reason for our stay. So we were there for six months. Um, he eventually came home for 13 days. Mm -hmm. And then um, we brought him back into the children's hospital um, because he was having a few issues at home with, you know, his breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was it. After that, we brought him back. He was there for a few weeks. Um, and then at six months and um, four days old, he passed in the NICU. So, so sorry. Thank, yeah. thank you for kind of taking us through that. I know that's emotional to hear as moms, and I know it's emotional for you to tell no matter how many times you tell it. So thank you for being here with us um, through that. So 
I guess my next question is, no NICU stay is looks like any other, I'm sure. Um, you know, some are short, some are long, some end relatively happily, and some end really in devastatingly. But do you think there are some, there have to be some kind of common struggles that NICU mamas face that you felt compelled to do something um, with, with your experience and create this community. Do you want to talk about kind of what, what the commonalities are or what the common struggles are for moms who have babies in the NICU? Absolutely. So I think one of the first things that we're faced with when we um, enter into the NICU is um, a loss of power. Mm -hmm. um, or a loss of control over our baby. Um, because what happens is you give birth to a baby, um, to your baby, and then they decide that your baby has to go to the NICU. Um, but you are still in labor. There's the afterbirth that needs to be delivered. You still have to take care of yourself and rest and heal. Mm -hmm. So immediately you and your baby are separated. Um, and unless there is someone from your family, whether it's your significant other or just someone from your support system that's there, you have no idea what is going on with your baby. And in, in my case, that was me because my mm -hmm. husband wasn't there in time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like one of the first things that I think all moms face mm -hmm. is just that worry of, you know, what's going on with my baby? Is my baby okay? You're not thinking about you and taking care of yourself so that you can be healthy for your baby. You're right. more concerned with what's going on um, with your baby. So yeah. that's definitely the first thing that we all have in common. Mm -hmm. um, and we just don't know what to do unless we've been in that situation before, but most right. of us haven't. Um, and there's a lot of things that the doctors won't tell you because mm -hmm. they know that you need to heal first. Right. Um, so you're pretty much just you know, left in the dark. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we're at risk for postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. um, and with us NICU moms, we're at risk for PTSD. So there are a lot of things that, you know, we have in common that yeah. we don't realize that we do. And that was kind of one of my reasons for wanting to do this because I wanted to bring awareness to these issues. Yeah. And so talk about some of the I don't know if we call them solutions or some tools that you have put together and that you're able to offer NICU mamas. So one of the things that we try to do is we try to share stories of other moms, mm -hmm. um, you know, what they're willing to share with us and with our audience um, so that moms who may be in the NICU now know that their situation isn't you know, one of a kind that there's someone else out there who has been in their shoes right? and who has a baby with similar anomalies or conditions. So that's one of the things that we try to do. Um, and then we just also try to educate the mom on the things that they can do while they're in the NICU. Um, you know, they might not have control of their baby's feeding schedule and changing schedule but they can be there at their baby's bedside to help with mm -hmm. those things. Um, they can be involved in their baby's point of care mm -hmm. and their doctor visits um, when they do rounds and things like that. Let's talk about that a little bit more in detail because I think those of us who've never experienced this, it, we just can't even imagine. Um, but it, it must be intimidating to have so many care providers, doctors and nurses and specialists but yet you're the parent. Can you can we talk about that relationship a little bit and maybe how you coach moms to advocate for their baby while still, you know, trusting and relying on the experts that are around them? Absolutely. So I think it is very intimidating, um, especially if you are not a medical professional yourself or you're not familiar with any of the terms and, and most of us aren't. Right. Um, so you first have to digest everything that is being said and you know your baby's conditions and you know get accustomed to what is going on first before you can even begin to speak up because I think that um, there are a lot of 
doctors and and nurses and things in the in the hospital that sometimes they they might not value what you have to say because they feel like this is their profession mm-hmm. and they've been doing it for so many years. Um, but it comes to a point as a mom that you have to trust your instincts mm-hmm. um, and speak up for your baby and advocate, you know, whether it's a nurse that you might not like the particular way that they're caring for your baby or it's a doctor that you might not like their plan of care. Mm-hmm. Um, you just have to, you know, speak up. It could be something as simple as, you know, the formula that they're giving your baby. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think just the confidence in knowing that, you know, this is your baby, you know, your baby the best. Um, And it it does take a team. So um, in our hospital, there were a dozen doctors. Mm -hmm. So finding the doctor and the nurses that work best for your team is what I would strongly suggest Mm -hmm. because you have to, you can't do it alone. Yeah. Um, so you absolutely have to um, build the team that, that is best for your baby. Well, and going back to the idea of support from others who've experienced this, I would think that that confidence would be so much easier if you had some kind of online support group or just other other moms who had been through it who can say you can trust your instincts you can ask for a different nurse or a different formula because i i feel like so many moms wouldn't even know that they had that authority because it's so easy to defer to the authority of the care providers um so i would think that the the support group or the facebook group or whatever it is could almost be kind of a background cheering section when you do have to make those kind of tough advocating conversations or whatever Absolutely. So I think that that is one of the reasons why the support group is most important because you can go into the support group and say, hey, um, I'm dealing with X, Y, and Z. How would you suggest dealing with this? Or what person in the hospital would you suggest going to? Um, because there are people who have might have dealt with a similar situation that can provide advice to um for how to handle that situation so support groups are very important um did, and i go ahead oh thank you um did did you find any natural support in the other parents who were in the NICU physically in the same unit as you or or is it so isolating and kind of consuming that the online version is almost easier did that question make sense yes um i didn't until um after half through halfway through our visit. Okay. Um, in the beginning, I feel like a lot of um, families are so consumed with, you know, digesting everything that's yeah, going on. I can see that. And figuring out, you know, what, what situation they're in and how they're going to get out of it that they're not concerned with you know, re- trying to relate to the other mom. And it's not like you're going to make small talk or, you yeah, know, like no, strike no, up a conversation. Small talk is not. Yeah. And, and being in the NICU is a very real situation. Yeah. You know, your, your baby might be there today and be doing great, but the baby next to you mm-hmm. might be, you know, literally fighting for the last moments of their life. Mm-hmm. So there's no small talk between right. you and the mom next door right. because this mom is trying to figure out. Yep how to save their baby or if their baby is even going to survive. Yeah. So it's very hard to kind of, you know, make small talk in that right. situation. Um, I know a lot of the hospitals do try to have um, like little powwows and mm-hmm. small like events and things for the parents so that they can meet each other while they're there. Yeah. But it's and still hard. Did you say that as your time went on there that you did make some meaningful bonds? I didn't mean to kind of yes. steer you off there. Yeah. Um, so it was a little bit after halfway through. Um, and my husband is much better at making small talk with people on the elevator. So he was <laughs> way more versed in, you know, this this dad is this baby's father. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so... But, you know, as the mom, I'm so focused on, okay, this is what's happening with Tristan today. Mm -hmm. And this is when he's getting fed and and X, Y, and Z. Like, I'm not making connections on the elevator or in the food court line. I'm so focused on something else. Um, 
but we did end up making, you know, a lot of good friends towards the end. Um, I actually have three moms that we were roommates with that we're pretty good friends with now. And, Mm -hmm. and so they've been very helpful with Mamas of the NICU and providing feedback and, Mm -hmm. and, um, and they're, they've been very involved. So it's been good, but it's, it's difficult to make friends. Yeah. And, and people are in and out on different timelines and schedules too. So I can see. Absolutely. So so let's go back to the idea of a more virtual support group. Can you talk a little more specifically about what Mamas of the NICU, the support, does it happen mostly on Facebook from a community standpoint? Yes. Um, So for the most part, we have a um, private Facebook group. So in order to be a member of the group, um, we do recommend, you know, being invited to the group by another NICU mom just for like security issues. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you do happen to come across the group, you have to answer questions in order to be um, accepted. And then, you know, you go through like a vet process. So we can Mm -hmm. actually make sure that you are who you say you are um, for just for security. And so we have right now, I think almost a hundred moms in there, Mm -hmm. both past and present. And, we talk about everything from how to get through Mother's Day, um, what kind of crafts can help you, um, you know, what kind of crafts can you make for Christmas, or what kind of books do you read to your baby, mm-hmm. um, because reading to preemies is, is very beneficial. So we talk about a lot of different things in there. Um, some moms are having another baby and they're worried about going back into the NICU, mm-hmm. so they might ask a question. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty open-ended. You can ask anything that you want. You can, you know, we celebrate milestones together. Mm-hmm. Um, we just had a mom who her daughter celebrated a year from graduating from the NICU. So it's it's a pretty well-rounded group, mm-hmm. and it's, it's been a good thing so far. So I'm excited for the future of that as well. That's, that's incredible. Um, talk a little bit about journaling, um, because I know that was really impactful for you. Can you talk about how, what that was like for you and why, why journaling has become a big part of what you're doing now? Yes. So when we first got into the NICU, um, we took a lot of pictures on our cell phones, mm-hmm. um, but I wanted to take be able to take notes and document Tristan's progress because mm-hmm. um, I didn't have access to his daily chart, which is a silly thing because, you know, as his parent, you should have access to his medical records and, and things like that. But unless, you know, his nurse or something goes through it with you, technically you're not supposed to look at it. Um, but I did anyways. Mm -hmm. So, um, I wanted to be able to document his daily process. And I saw a lot of other moms in our room at the time because we had three other, um, roommates and they would write notes in composition journals. Mm -hmm. And so that really inspired me because that was, you know, a good way to write it down and to just sit and let everything out rather than, you know, putting a quick note into my phone because right. the notes in your phone, I felt like they're not as in depth. Yeah. And um, I almost feel like our, our brains are so scattered when we're on our phones. I just, yeah. I find that even just with making to-do lists and things, there's something yeah. like distracting about being on your phone, even if you're in a notes app taking notes, it's, it's yes. different than pen to paper. So yeah, yeah. go ahead. I didn't you'll mean to. get like a notification and yes. you'll be completely th- thrown off of yes. your train of thought. So it is, it's very distracting. And so um, maybe about two or three weeks into our stay, um, there was, I heard about this HP sprocket that was being released. And it's like a mini printer that prints um, photos. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take a picture every single day of Tristan's progress and I'm going to print it out and I'm going to document it in a journal. And so we went to Best Buy. It wasn't even on the shelves yet. So the guy had to go into the back and search for it. And we ended up buying one and I bought a, a little, it was a journal. It wasn't 
it wasn't guided or anything. There were no questions. There were no dates. It was just a journal, and every date had a quote. Uh, every page had a quote on it. Okay. Um, and so I would print out the picture, and I would just sit, and I would write, you know, how Tristan was doing that day, or maybe write, like, a little note to Tristan of things that we would do when he would come home. So that's how I kind of started journaling. Mm -hmm. But then on days when... Tristan wasn't doing so well, or there was a lot going on. I had a really hard time with writing and figuring out what exactly to write. Mm -hmm. So that's when the idea came to me to create a Nikki journal that would be able to help moms figure out their day to day, like what to write every mm -hmm. day. And then where to put the vitals and so that it's organized and not just all over the place because a lot of things happen in a 24 hour period in mm -hmm. the NICU and if you're not an organized person your journal will look it'll mm -hmm. just look like a foreign language mm -hmm. so I wanted to make something that moms could use that was organized and it gave them the time to write and allowed them to acknowledge what feelings they were feeling mm -hmm. in a given day. Um, and then another reason for that was I felt like in the NICU, I was going through a lot of things mentally mm -hmm. that I just didn't know how to put down on paper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my family growing up, we didn't believe in like counseling and, and things like that. So at the time, that wasn't even finding time to go to therapy mm -hmm. wasn't even an option um, because I had to be with my baby all mm -hmm. the time. So or whenever, you know, I wasn't at home with my daughter and my husband. So I had to figure out how to balance that and to spend time with everyone. And so putting these different emotions in a journal where I could check how I was feeling in a day. Mm -hmm made me more aware mm -hmm. of what I needed mm -hmm. for myself. So that was, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to create the journal so that other moms could do the same thing for them too. Um, that's because that's I know incredible. a lot of moms, they, they deal with things that, and, and they don't, they know that it's not normal, but they think that it, they're the only person going yeah. through it and they're right. not. Right. Um, so that that physical journal that you created, NICU moms can order from your site, correct? And it's, yes. And it ships out to them. It's it's a physical product, not a, like yes. a printable. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's that's amazing. Um, Bianca, we're going to take a quick break for a sponsor spot, and then we're going to get back into this. So we'll be right back, guys. All right, guys. Furniture shopping is a struggle. You want something that looks great and it's going to last, but you don't want to spend $5,000 on a new sofa. Not when you're in the raising kids years. Plus, let's get real. You don't need bulky, oversized furniture that's going to require like 10 neighbors or professional movers just to get it in the door, let alone up the stairs, down the stairs to the basement. So the founder of Campaign felt exactly the same way, and he built a company made for people like us. Yay! Campaign makes sofas, chairs, love seats, and ottomans that are built to last, and everything they sell is made using quality materials like steel frame that comes with a lifetime guarantee. What I love is their furniture arrives in just a few days in a flat pack box, one of those magical boxes that your couch is inside, and you don't have to be there. You don't have to wait around and schedule that delivery in that weird window of time where they don't show up. Each piece is also made to assemble in just a few minutes, and you don't even need tools. I also love that they have easy-to-remove covers so you can change the look of your home without having to buy a whole new sofa. And, of course, it means that for all those kid messes and dog messes and pet messes and everything life messes, you can wash the covers easily or replace them. So here's what I want you to do. Check out Campaign Living dot com to see the goods and then we've got a special deal for our listeners you can save $75 off any sofa love seat or chair that's $75 off when you use the code mom at checkout so you go to campaignliving.com and use the code mom at checkout to save $75 off your order okay I'm back with Bianca and I want to talk a little bit about um, those of us who have not had babies in the NICU um, because almost all of us know somebody who has. Um, have you thought about, I'm sure you have, um, 
the best way for non NICU mamas to support NICU mamas? I mean, does this come up in the Facebook group? I'm sure there's a million blog posts out there written about it, but I, I'd, I'd love your input specifically on the things that were most helpful. Um, you know, it sounds so cliche, but sometimes we just don't know how much to ask or how much to do or how close to get um, when somebody's going through this. So I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah, so that was one of the very first things that we talked about in the group. Um, because from a personal standpoint, that was something that I wanted to get feedback from from other moms. Um, because although we had support, you know, our friends and family didn't know how to support. So I wanted to get feedback from other moms on how we could educate friends and family of NICU moms and you know, educate them on what to do. So one of the things that a lot of moms said that they would have loved is um, meals Mm -hmm. for their family at Mm -hmm. home so that cooking wasn't something that they needed to worry about. Right. Um, So, you know, there's so many services out there now where you can order online and have Mm -hmm. things delivered to their houses. So that's one of the main things that they mentioned. And then, um, gas cards because a lot of mm-hmm. parents drive back and forth and some end up having to go back to work. And so, you know, those gas cards are very helpful for the parents that have to drive back and forth yeah. to the hospital. Um, so there are so many things that family members and friends can do to help moms. And then just having a mental check-in, you know, mm-hmm. how are you doing today? Mm-hmm. Most of the time it's how is the baby doing? Yeah. Um, And while that's important, I think what a lot of people don't realize is eventually the baby has to come home Mm -hmm. to someone Mm -hmm. and more than likely mom is going to be the um, hold most of the responsibility for caring for the baby while they're at home. So just checking in, asking how they're doing, um, if they had the chance to do something for themselves today, whether it's a a long shower or washing their hair or, you know, just eating something, Mm -hmm. just simply checking in with them and making sure that they're okay and they have everything that they need. Um, Did you, did you find that you wanted, um, sometimes some kind of distracting light, fluffy media, like magazines or like a great audio book or a podcast or I guess because I work in podcasting and media I just feel like there's so much power in meaningful media whether it's a really supportive book or totally a funny book that has nothing to do with what they're going through did you find that you wanted any of that and and might that be something that a non-NICU mom could gift somebody going through this yeah I found that um comedy helped me through a lot yeah. so I found myself watching like funny videos on my phone whenever mm-hmm. I was at the NICU and like Tristan was sleeping or you know he was busy doing getting doing something else right um you know whether it was he was eating and I couldn't hold or he was taking a nap um I found myself like watching funny videos or scrolling through Facebook so I definitely think books and magazines and even um you know, podcasts and listening to different radio shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some moms don't have headphones. So those are, that would be something that, you know, could be gifted to the mom Mm -hmm. because they're going to watch this, you know, on their cell phone or their iPad or their laptop. So headphones that are comfy and that you can wear for a long period of time. Yeah, I like that Um, idea. And then books or magazines. There were a lot of moms who... Um, always had a new book in their hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so definitely. I think I think that that there's a lot there. Um, so you mentioned your daughter was at home during this time period, and and I think this is a natural segue too, because another way that I think um, we can help is by not losing sight of what's happening on the f- home front. You talked about meals, but I could also see you know, carpool or play dates for other siblings. And maybe you have some thoughts because you did have, like you said, a five, was she five at the time at home? Yes, she was five. Cause that's um, gotta be, I mean, just your heart's in two places at once. And that's what I've heard from yep. other NICU moms too, is yeah. it's not as simple when there's siblings at home. So maybe just talk generally about that. Yeah. When, when there are siblings, things get 
a lot more difficult because you have to then worry about the sibling and what they're going through emotionally and how they're dealing with things. And every child is different and they're going to react in different ways. Um, but for example, for us, um, Tatiana's behavior changed. Mm -hmm. So um, she was, you know, acting out, she was getting angry at times. She was doing um, just things that were not normal for her. So we had to be hyper vigilant about, you know, on an everyday basis and watch out for different signs. So I think definitely one thing that never luckily changed for her was her um, her behavior in school. But when mm -hmm. she was home, yeah, things were different because she felt like, you know, mom and dad weren't spending as much time with her. And so things changed for us. Mm -hmm. And she did not, you know, being in a hospital is boring. Yeah. And, and so our daily routine was I would drop her off at school. I would go to the NICU. And then when it was time to pick her up from school, I would pick her up. We would go to the NICU. She would do her homework. And then if her brother was awake, they would play until she got tired of playing or until he got tired of playing. And then she would find something to do. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the time it was like coloring, which she got bored of very easily, yeah. um, you know, or watching her iPad, just something. Luckily they had at our hospital a very good um, child. Um, I can't remember the proper title for her, but she was a child behavior mm -hmm. person, specialist. Um, and she had a tote full of crafts and always had something that she would bring yeah. Tatiana, whatever Tatiana was there. So she always had something to do, but she just didn't like being there. Yeah. And I don't think that it wasn't, it wasn't that she didn't like being there. It was because she didn't like her brother being there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so traumatic. When it's, it's very hard for us as moms to figure out what, the right balance is mm -hmm. because there isn't really a right balance. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, I noticed on your site that you have a NICU survival kit. Can you talk about that? I mean, it's, I just, on the page, it's really cool. It looks like anybody can donate a NICU survival kit, but talk about what's in the kits and why. Um, and then, you know, how you got this idea. Yes. Yeah, so when I got the idea because when we went into the NICU, um, you know, I had my regular hospital bag packed because, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't expect to be in the NICU for as long as I was. Um, so eventually, like, I ran out of things and, like, toiletries and things like that. And so because Tristan was there for so long, we had a small bucket underneath his crib that just had like toiletries and books and things that I needed mm -hmm. um, and then things, you know, from home for Tristan. So the survival kit became something like a, a, a starter kit for Nikki yeah. moms. So in it, it has toiletries, um, like deodorant, toothbrush, mouthwash, um, See what else is in the hair ties because that is so so important. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many times I had to borrow a hair tie from a nurse <laughs> because I didn't have one. Um, there's a baby board book in there for keeping at the baby's bedside to read to them. There is a um, a plain notebook just for jotting down little notes or things. And there's a tumbler in there um, for water mm -hmm. so that moms can stay hydrated. Because um, in the you have to have a, um, if you technically you're not supposed to have a cup in there, but if you do, it has to have a lid. Okay. So, um, and then there's a, a Wubba Nub, which mm -hmm. um, was something special that we put in there for Tristan. Mm -hmm. So, because that was his, drafts were his favorite and his giraffe webinar was one of the things that he could not 
live without. So for our listeners, I think there. most of our listeners know, but the Webinubs are the kind of the infant pacifier with like almost like a lovey attached, right? Like a little yes. they can yes. grab onto. They're so um, cute. So they come in all different animals, but the giraffe is um, for Tristan. So no. we have three different options. The um, smallest option is just the toiletries and the, um, the notebooks in the book. Mm-hmm. But then the middle option is all of the toiletries, the books, and then our soft cover journal. Okay. And then the um, third option is the survival kit with um, the hardcover journal in it. And it comes in a bag. Um, right now they come in Skip Hop diaper mm-hmm. bags mm-hmm. Um, that were donated to us by Skip Hop. So once we run out of those, we'll get either another donation or um you know it'll be in a backpack that we purchase if right. if someone so right. if someone donates on the website right. that's what the money goes towards buying the supplies for the right. kit. so right um and then how are these kits distributed are they are you distributing those or tell me more about that yes so if you go to our website and you um decide say you know someone who is a, in the NICU and you want to donate a survival kit to them, you would fill out all the informa- information, place the purchase, and mm-hmm. then tell us where you wanted the survival kit to be delivered Got it. To. Okay. So it is, you can actually gift it to somebody you know. It's not just yes. being, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's such a, such a cool idea. Um, well, I want to switch gears a little bit. We touched on this in the first part of the show, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about kind of partnering with the caregivers and the hospital staff during your stay. We, You and I kind of focused on some of the hard parts about that, maybe a nurse who's not your style or whatever. But I also know of some really beautiful relationships that come out of these NICU stay. Do you have any tips for kind of going into these relationships with an open mind and kind of, I don't know, creating the best partnership that there can be with your medical team? Yeah, I would definitely say that um, you should give everyone a chance Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, there are a lot of great nurses and doctors who have been doing this for years. And then there are also a lot of great new nurses that Mm -hmm. might just be, you know, they might be have only been doing this for a couple of months. And that really gives you the opportunity to allow them to get to know Mm-hmm. your baby and mm-hmm. the, you, to work really well together you know the way that you guys both like things done but still following the rules mm-hmm. that they have to follow um but I definitely would say give everyone a chance first because you never know who you're gonna like and who you're gonna mm-hmm. want to be a part of your support system so definitely give everyone a chance and you know, if there's someone who you really love, ask them if they're willing to be a primary for your baby. Okay. Um, so that when they are there, they can care for your baby. Okay. I didn't even know that was a thing you could do. Yes. So. Yes. I would definitely suggest that. Um, so, and it makes it a little bit easier too, so that if you do have to, you know, step away from their bedside for a couple of hours, you know that, okay, my baby is in good hands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. Um, well, I, I do want to ask before we wrap up about your experience with loss, because that, you know, is part of your story. It's not part of every NICU story. Are there any resources or communities that you found um, as you, you know, or go through your grief, Tristan's passing, um, that you feel like would be helpful to share with our listeners? Um. So I was, well, I guess my husband and I were lucky enough, if that's what you want to call it, (laughs) um, (laughs) to have a, you know, very close friends that experienced this prior to us. And so they were really one of our Mm go-tos when this had happened, actually. She was one of the first people that I called after calling my family and at the time we lived literally five minutes apart. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, she came to the hospital and then, um, her husband and and her were very 
much there for anything that we needed um, support wise. Mm -hmm. So every, everyone is going to deal with grief differently. And I think that that's something that you have to realize in the beginning, Mm -hmm. um, especially with your children and especially with your husband, because men deal with it Mm -hmm. not the same way as women at all. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think you have to realize that in the beginning and just take it breath by breath Mm -hmm. um, and acknowledge that sometimes, you know, others' behavior, it might not be because they're angry. It might be because they're grieving. Mm -hmm. So you have to acknowledge everyone's grieving style and respect that. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the advice that I would give um, if anyone else was in the situation. Yeah, no, I thank you for that. Um, So I'm hoping that this conversation has really opened our listeners' eyes to how to help their you know, friends and people they know who are in the NICU or, you know, if that this they find themselves in this situation. If we have anybody listening who right now has a baby in the NICU or somebody who wants to send this episode to a friend, what's the first thing that a NICU mom can do to get involved with your community? Like, what's the thing? Is it to go to the website and sign up or what's where should they go? So the first thing that I would say is to go to just go to our Facebook group. So it's okay. um or to our Facebook page and you can find the group on there. So it's okay. Facebook.com slash mamas of the NICU. Okay. And that is our page. The group okay. is on there so you can join okay. the group directly from there. Okay. Um and then you can even get it to our website from there. Okay. So that would be the first step. You can find pretty much everything. Okay. There. That's amazing. And our listeners know that whenever we do these interviews, everything that you and I talked about will be linked up at the momhour.com. So you guys listening, you can just head to the momhour.com and then if you forget Bianca's Facebook page, um, we will link everything there that we've talked about. So that's another easy way. Um, Bianca, thank you so much for this. Um, I feel really grateful that you took the time with us and just really glad that our listeners got to hear from you. So, um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This was really good. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. I want to remind you that you can subscribe to The Mom Hour wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you like to listen. And if you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you left us a review so that others can discover the show more easily. Don't forget to visit our website at themomhour.com to get all the links discussed in today's episode. And Megan and I will be back with a brand new episode on Tuesday. Have a great weekend, everybody.